exist to see God glorified and disciples multiplied through the power of the gospel. If you were here last week, you'll remember that we talked about John the Baptist and his great example. He was an incredibly humble and godly man, so godly in fact that Jesus called John the Baptist the greatest man ever born of woman. And even though John the Baptist was the first prophet in over 400 years, he speaks very little of himself. John's entire life was about pointing others to the Messiah and away from himself. Most commentators agree that John the Baptist's last words in the Gospel of John are in verse 30. He says, he must increase, but I must decrease. So now in our passage, John the Gospel writer is going to explain why Jesus must increase. And uh, just, like in the, in, and just like in verse 16 that we saw a couple weeks ago, uh, John, the gospel writer, wants to make sure there's no confusion about who Jesus is. So he spends a few verses giving us a picture of who Jesus really is, so there's no confusion. So with that being said, let's pray and we'll dive into this text. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the example of John the Baptist. Thank you for his humility and his faithful service. But this morning, show us why he had to decrease. Help us to know how to imitate John's life, even in the way he had to decrease. Paint a clear picture in our minds of who Jesus truly is. Help us to understand why he was the one who had to increase. Help us to see Jesus with clear vision and pure hearts this morning. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read the whole text before we jump in. Look with me at verse 31. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets a seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the spirit without measure. The father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. When I say the word of the Lord, will you say thanks be to God? The word of the Lord? Thanks be to God. Amen. The German monk and reformer Martin Luther once wrote to one of his critics and said, Your thoughts about God are all too human. This devastating remark was so impactful that we're still talking about it more than 500 years later. But it begs the question... Are our thoughts about God all too human? This certainly isn't a new problem. In Psalm 50, God was rebuking Israel. And while he was confronting them about their sin, God said, you thought that I was just like you. Our thoughts about God are not irrelevant. They affect how we treat him and how we live our lives. And this doesn't just apply to God the Father, but often we have thoughts about Jesus that are all too human. And what's even more common is that we have thoughts of ourselves that are all too divine. We think a lot of ourselves and we think too little of God. And what ends up happening is that we create a God in our own minds who looks a lot more like ourselves than anything else. We settle for a Jesus who is more human than divine. He gives us good advice, but he's not really worthy of our worship. And then it's no wonder that we're bored with Jesus and we try to find joy and happiness in anything and everything else. There's a show that came out a while ago called The Good Place, all about the afterlife. And at one point in the show, the main characters are in heaven, or what they call The Good Place. But they run into a huge problem. Everyone in The Good Place is slowly losing their mind because eternal bliss gets boring after a few hundred years. And I could relate to that thought because if you've ever gotten to the end of Amazing Grace and you're singing, When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun will no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And you're thinking, really? 10,000 years of singing? I mean, I like to worship and, and I like to sing, but I, I'm going to need a break after a few songs. Is that really what heaven is going to be like? Well, let me say two things. First, we're going to do a lot more in heaven than just sing. But secondly, in heaven, it will be impossible to be bored with God. In my professional TV critic opinion, the reason people in the good place got bored is because there was no infinitely glorious and interesting God at the center of their afterlife. 
If you think that you're going to get bored in heaven after a few million years, then your God is too small. God is the infinite fountain of joy and delight. We can try to wrap our minds around what it means to behold God forever, but to think about the endless joys of heaven is a bottomless ocean. We can discover more and more of God's beauty and majesty, but we will never exhaust the infinite fountain of joy and delight and discovery. But I think the reason we get bored with God now in our lives and the reason we'll think we'll be bored in heaven is because our thoughts about God are all too human. And when our thoughts about God are too human, we don't get to see him in all of his glory. A.W. Pink once said, The God of this century no more resembles the sovereign of Holy Scripture than does the dim flickering of a candle the glory of the midday sun. Comparing a dim flickering candle to the glory of the midday sun. So what I want to do this morning is give you a picture of Jesus who is not like us. What I want to do this morning is to blow out that candle and show you the glory of the midday sun. I want to show you a Jesus who is altogether different and more glorious than we could ever even imagine. I want to show you a Jesus who is worthy of your worship. My prayer this morning is that you would see Jesus in all of his glory because in John 3 verses 31 through 36, we're going to find five reasons why Christ is greater than all. In this passage, we know that Jesus is being compared to John the Baptist, but we're going to see five reasons why Jesus is greater than every creature and every created thing in the entire universe. So first, we're going to see that Jesus is from God in verse 31. Second, we're going to see that that Jesus speaks for God in verses 32 and 33. Third, we're going to see that Jesus is full of God. I'll explain what that means when we get to verse 34. Fourth, we're going to see that Jesus rules as God in verse 35. And finally, we're going to see that Jesus saves from God in verse 36. That's a lot of reasons why Jesus is greater than all. So let's dive in with the first reason. Jesus is from God. If you'll look with me to verse 31. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. John, the gospel writer, uses this metaphor of earthly versus heavenly to compare Jesus to John the Baptist. John was, of course, a sinner, but when he's described as belonging to the earth, that's not referring to his sinfulness. Usually when John, the gospel writer, is trying to call the planet sinful, He uses the word world, but whenever he wants to refer to the planet as a neutral area, as a location, he uses the word earth. So so this is what I think John is doing. I think John, the gospel writer, is emphasizing where John the Baptist came from versus where Jesus came from. John came from Israel, from earth, and he's limited in what he says, but Jesus comes from above or from heaven. So he is in no way limited in the same way that John was. Remember that we've already learned about a lot about Jesus in the study of the book. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then you jump to verse 14 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And even though Jesus was born of Mary in Bethlehem and he's truly human, his origin story did not begin with Mary in Bethlehem. Jesus was with God in the beginning. And he was not just with God. He was one with the Father and with the Spirit. All things in heaven and on earth and in the invisible kingdoms were made through Jesus and by Jesus and for Jesus. But Jesus did not think of equality with God as something to grasp onto, as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and took on flesh. He was sent from heaven in a way that no other prophet ever was. So you notice in verse 28 that John the Baptist was sent. But clearly, in this verse 31, Jesus was sent in a far different way than John the Baptist was. But Jesus is not simply greater because he is from God, but he also speaks the very words of God. He speaks for God. Look with me to verse 32. He bears witness to what he has seen. And heard, yet no one receives his testimony. In this verse, notice what Jesus bears witness of. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard. No other prophet speaks like this. 
Every other prophet has received information through God revealing it to them, but not with Jesus. Jesus is an eyewitness of heavenly things. Nothing was ever revealed to Jesus. He speaks from firsthand experience. John was a great prophet, but he was only giving secondhand information. That's why Hebrews 1 says, Long ago and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, through whom he created the world. Jesus is the one from heaven, and he speaks for God, not only because he was there and he witnesses, but he actively participated in the creation of all things. He is the creator of the heaven and earth. Interestingly, even though he is the only one who has come down from heaven, what happens when he speaks? Look at verse 32. It says that no one receives his testimony. Now, obviously, we know some received his testimony, but the point of verse 32 is that most of the people who heard Jesus' words did not believe him. There are many who would say that if only God would show them a miracle or if he would come down in heaven and speak to them, then they would finally believe. Well, not only is God under no obligation to perform like a genie in a bottle, but even if God showed up and wrote his name in the clouds telling that person to repent, most would not believe. Why? Remember what verse 20 says. Everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. The people of Jesus' day saw his miracles, heard the very words of God, firsthand experience, yet they did not come to him. Why? Because their deeds were evil. The real issue is almost never whether Christianity is actually true. The real issue is that Jesus calls sinners to repent. And the world loves their sin more than they love the light. But obviously, some do receive the word of Jesus. Because if you look at verse 33, here's what it says. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. John uses this strange picture of setting your seal. And what does that mean? Well, the seal was an official mark made on a legal document at that time. If John were to have written this today... He probably would have written, whoever receives his testimony signs on the dotted line. Something we can all relate to. Whoever receives Jesus is testifying that God's words are true because Jesus speaks for God. And to believe Jesus is to believe God. No one can say, I believe in God, but I don't believe in Jesus. And that's why John wrote later in, in a letter, 1 John chapter 2, he said, no one who denies the son has the father. Whoever confesses the Son also has the Father. The two are inseparable. So that you cannot believe in the Father without Jesus or Jesus without the Father. But all who believe in Jesus are saying that God is true because Jesus speaks the very words of God. And because he speaks for God, Jesus is greater than all who came before him. Think about the prophets that at times they were inspired in their speech, that at times they were inspired in what they were writing. Every word that came from the mouth of Jesus were the very words of God. Other prophets spoke, but this is what they were saying. They said, thus saith the Lord. When Jesus spoke, you notice he doesn't say that. He has an authority unlike any other prophet that comes before him. Jesus speaks with an authority unlike all before him because he came from God and he speaks for God, but also because Jesus is full of God. Look with me to verse 34. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the spirit without measure. Every word that Jesus spoke was of God. Why? Because he was the one who was given the spirit without measure. During our Old Testament reading, we saw that God promised to send a descendant of Jesse, who was King David's father. And this son of Jesse would have the spirit of the Lord rest upon him. And we've already seen the spirit descend on Jesus at his baptism. But in this verse, I think John is telling us that Jesus is that spirit filled son of Jesse that was promised to come. He is this Messiah. But notice in verse 34, Jesus is not simply given the Spirit. He's given the Spirit without measure. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would show up and he gives power to certain people depending on what God had called them to do. For Samson, he gave strength. 
To Solomon, he gave wisdom. But here we have someone who God has given the spirit to without limit or qualification. Matthew Henry described it this way. The spirit dwells in Jesus, not as in a vessel, but as in a fountain, as in a bottomless ocean. The prophet of olds had different measures of the spirit. But for Jesus, there is no way he could be any less filled with the spirit. Why can Jesus utter the very words of God every time he opens his mouth? Because he is full of God. Not only is he God from all of eternity, but he is eternally and perfectly united with God, the Holy Spirit. He is the spirit without measure because the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are one being and one essence. They are perfectly undivided. The mystery of the Trinity is deeper than you or I could ever imagine. I believe the Trinity is perfectly logical and biblical, but it is not an easy teaching to think about. And I, I, I would challenge you that if you understand your God perfectly, your God is far too small. But in verse 34, we find the massively complicated yet glorious God of all of creation because Jesus is full of God. He is truly greater than anyone else and anyone else. But not only is Jesus full of God, he also rules as God. Look with me to verse 35. The father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. Before we go into Jesus' rule, I want you to notice something. A few weeks ago, we talked about how God so loved the world. And we talked about how God loves with an agape, unconditional, eternal, heavenly kind of love. Well, in verse 35... God the Father loves God the Son with that same kind of agape, unconditional love. And I don't think it's a coincidence that John uses the same word for love here. I think that the love the Father has for Jesus is the same love that he has for us. Because how do we receive the love that God showed to the world? Only through Jesus. Only by receiving Jesus. Because when we believe in Jesus, we become united with him. So closely united with Jesus that the Father is able to look at us and he sees us with the same level of love and affection and approval that he has for Jesus. What a comfort, comforting thought. That's the love of the Father. The love we have received is based on Jesus and who he is and not in what we have done. And it's a beautiful thought because if it were based on me, I'd be constantly terrified of losing that love. But back to verse 35. When we heard John the Baptist say a person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given from heaven. And then we see in verse 35, what has Jesus received? All things. Wait a second. Is this just an exaggeration like in verse 27 or in verse 32? Well, that's a good question. But in the original language, in verse 35, that word all that we see in verse 35 literally means all. All things were given to Jesus. Jesus is the rightful owner of all things. But he left behind the glories of heaven and humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. But then God raised him from the dead and God elevated him to the highest place of honor and gave him the name above all other names. And that at that name, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will declare that Jesus Christ is Lord unto the glory of God the Father. Amen, church? Amen. Jesus is King and he rules as God. That's why Ephesians 1 says that Jesus is seated on the throne in heaven above any ruler or authority or power or leader. That's why Hebrews says that Jesus is ruling and reigning in heaven. And God the Father has said to him, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Jesus is the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. But remember that no one takes his life from him. Jesus is the king of the universe and everything has always gone according to plan, is going according to plan, and will go according to plan. And someone may say, well, wait a second. How can Jesus be in charge and yet the world is still broken? How can I be experiencing this pain or going through this trial if Jesus is on the throne right now? Remember, my friend, that this God has always used these kinds of things to perfectly accomplish his plan. Amen. 
There's no better example than the cross of Jesus. Remember that in Acts, Peter says, Jesus was handed over by God's deliberate plan and wicked men put him to death by nailing him on a cross. What those men did to Jesus was pure evil, but it was all according to God's perfect plan. And it was the greatest thing that has ever happened in the history of the universe. And I don't know what you're going through, but if you're a believer, then God has promised that he is working all things together for the good of those who love him. And that's, I mean, does that just lift a huge burden off your shoulders? God is in control. It's going according to his plan. And even in the pain you are experiencing, God has purpose for it. This side of eternity, we don't always see and understand what the purpose is, but God has one and he is infinitely good. Jesus has no equal. No one rivals him. He is on the throne. He is in control. The devil is powerless to stop him. And Jesus has already conquered death, hell, and the grave when he rose from the dead. Amen, somebody. Amen. That's the Jesus we worship. That's a God worth worshiping. That's my Jesus. He's the king of the universe because God the Father has given all things into his hand. And he rules the universe as God the Son. John the Baptist was only an ambassador, but Christ is king. And therefore, Christ is greater than all people and all things. But he's not just greater because he rules as God. He's also greater because he saves from God. Look with me to verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. This verse should remind you of another verse. It's very popular that we've already talked about. I think John is summarizing everything he's talked about in the entire chapter with this verse. That He's even going back to John 3.16 and he's rephrasing it. He starts with that universal offer of forgiveness. That salvation and forgiveness and grace was not just given to the nation of Israel, but whoever. Jesus died for people of every race, every ethnicity, every social class, every everything. All who come to trust in Jesus will have eternal life. And notice, it does not say whoever believes will one day have eternal life. It says, has eternal life. Salvation isn't something you get when you die. It's something you get when you believe in Jesus. And when you do that, you have eternal life. No works, no religious ritual, nothing but simple faith to have access to the perfect love and righteousness of Jesus and to have that everlasting life. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. But there is a dark warning at the end of this chapter left for those who do not believe. John writes, whoever does not obey the son shall not see life. It's interesting that John doesn't write whoever does not believe, because that's what I would have written if I was writing this verse. What does he, what does he say instead of believing? He says, whoever does not obey. Why does he say obey instead of believing? Because the call to believe on Jesus is not optional. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. And whoever does not believe disobeys the command of the sovereign king of the universe. And those who disobey will not see life. But not only that, John writes, the wrath of God abides on him. It's not as though you and I were doing great until we decided to reject Jesus. But the wrath of God was already upon us. Romans 2 says that every time that we sin, we're storing up wrath in heaven that's going to be revealed on the day of judgment but that begs the question what is the wrath of god well if you look at what john wrote in revelation 14 10 you can turn there if you like but i'm just going to read the verse we'll see exactly what he means by wrath revelation 14 10 is talking about all those in hell and it says they will also drink the wine of god's wrath and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the lamb what is wrath Revelation 14 says wrath is torment. And even though John doesn't say eternal wrath in John 3, in Revelation 14, 11, he goes on, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. The eternal conscious 
torment of sinners is a sobering topic because that's what all of us deserve if God gave us what we were due. Isn't that a little extreme though? Why is the punishment for sinning so severe? Well, part of the answer is that we have no idea who God really is and how holy he is. There's a view of sin that says your actions are only bad if they hurt someone else. But that's not the biblical view. Our sin, whether or not it hurts anyone else, is wrong because it offends and it's an affront to a holy God. When we sin, we are assaulting the glory of God. And the reason we don't understand why God pours out his wrath is because our thoughts of God are all too human. We think of God as another guy just like us, as the good man upstairs. But, but think about this. If a man sins against a rock, then he's not guilty at all because it's just a rock. If a man sins against his wife, he's sleeping on the couch. If a man sins against a police officer, he's going to end up in the back of the car with handcuffs on. If a man sins against a judge, then he's going to jail. The person you sin against determines the punishment that is going to take place. The person you sin against determines how harsh the penalty is. So if a man sins against a holy and eternal God, the punishment likewise will be holy and eternal. These are hard truths, but they're biblical truths. This should wake us up to the reality that we desperately need someone to save us from God. It should wake us up to the reality that hell is real and that people are going there when they reject Jesus. And that we need to be the ones that tell, to tell them that there is someone who saves from God. And thanks be to God that Jesus is that someone. As strange as it might sound, Jesus saves us from his own wrath. Because he's a good judge and must judge sin. But he also loves and has mercy. And so he came to die for sinners. And everything that we've been talking about. Everything Jesus is. Everything Jesus did was to save sinners from the wrath of God. He drank that cup of God's wrath on the cross. And he died for sinners so that we could be saved. So that we could receive everlasting life through faith. in the one who is greater than all who came before him. And all who will come after him. Amen church? This is the Jesus we worship. This is the Jesus of the Bible. And by the grace of God, this is the Jesus who loves us and died for us. And who we seek to serve and to love and know with all that we are. He is the one from God. He is the one who speaks for God. He is the one who is full of God. He is the one who rules as God. And truly, truly, I say to you, he is the one who saves from God. Amen, somebody. Amen. That's our Jesus. Praise the Lord. My prayer this morning was that you would see Jesus in all of his glory. Because in John 3, verses 31 through 36, we found five reasons why Christ is greater than all. Found five reasons why Jesus is greater than every creature and every created thing in the universe. So compared to John 3, what are your thoughts about God like? How has your relationship with Jesus been? How has your Bible reading been? If they've been flat and you're bored with the things of God, it's probably because your thoughts about God are far too human. When you imagine heaven, do you ever think it might be boring? And that's probably because all of us have a view of God that is far too small. It's impossible to exaggerate the greatness and the glory of God. And I know that even in this sermon, as I've gone on for 28 minutes, I have only scratched the surface. But if your thoughts are like mine, are, are far too human, then I have three pastoral charges for you. Three ways in which we can apply this text to our lives and see Jesus in all his glory, or at least attempt to. So first pastoral charge, worship Jesus for all he is. Worship Jesus for all he is. We are inclined to pick and choose the parts of Jesus we like and to get rid of the parts we don't like. Some overemphasize his love. Some overemphasize his power and his justice, but we need to seek to have a view of Jesus that is not shaped by what we like, but, we, but is shaped by how Jesus reveals himself in the Bible. And there's a vast ocean to explore if we want to get to know him better. St. Jerome, the famous Bible translator, once said, The scriptures are shallow enough for a babe to come and drink without fear of drowning, and deep enough for a theologian to swim in without ever touching the bottom. We don't merely read our Bibles because we're supposed to. We read our Bibles to know God, to get a glimpse of the glory of God. 
We need to give up all of our human thoughts about Jesus and embrace him for who he truly is. So worship Jesus for all he is. Second pastoral charge, rest in the fact that Jesus is king. Rest in the fact that Jesus is king. First off, politically, I know a lot of people have strong opinions about who should be in charge. Hey, I have strong opinions about it, but our ultimate hope will never come from the right politician enacting the right policies. Politics will only ever make you worried and anxious and angry with everyone who disagrees with you until you realize that no matter who is president, Jesus Christ is king. No prime minister, no president will ever turn the power of the prince of peace. No one rivals our God. He is the conquering king of all. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen, somebody. That's why we can rest at night. And look, I think it's important to be an informed voter. I think it's important to to know what's going on. But there comes a point when you need to unplug and pray and say, Lord, I can't control this, but you can. So I trust you and I'm leaving it in your hands. The mainstream media, all media really doesn't make money by telling you things are going great. Their ratings go up when they have something horrible to report. They are not there to calm your worries. They're in the money business and too much cable news will easily rob you of your joy. Amen. So we got to rest in the fact that Jesus is our king. But even more, po- more important than politics, if Jesus is not king, then we are in serious trouble and we have no reason to trust at all. It doesn't matter how good Jesus is or how great of a savior is, because if he's not in control, then he cannot guarantee a single one of his promises. In the words of pastor and theologian, R.C. Sproul, if there is one maverick molecule in all the universe, then God is not sovereign. And if God is not sovereign, he is not God. But Jesus is the sovereign king of the universe. He is ruling and reigning and working everything out in the best possible way, even if we don't understand what's happening. Jesus is infinitely good and infinitely wise and infinitely powerful. And for those reasons, the sovereignty of God and the lordship and kingship of Jesus is the pillow that we can rest our heads on at night, knowing he is in control. So rest in the fact that Jesus is king. Final pastoral charge. Trust Jesus as your savior. Trust Jesus as your savior. If you've heard nothing today, Jesus alone can save you from the judgment of almighty God. Trust him as your savior. Run to the cross for it's your only hope and my only hope. And Christian, continue to trust in that old rugged cross. Cling to it as if your eternity depends on it because it does. Because on that old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. Hi, Taylor Callen, pastor of Oregon Baptist Church. Thank you so much for listening to this sermon. I pray that you are more encouraged and love Jesus and the gospel more after hearing the sermon than when you first sat down to listen to it. Know that that our heart at this church is that this sermon would be an encouragement to you and would be a useful resource, but would in no way replace the pastor that God has called to shepherd you or the church that you're called to be a member of. With that being said, If you want more information about our church or want to hear more sermons, go to horicanbaptist.com.